This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with another wonderful episode of Jews You Should Know. Very excited this week to have on Rabbi David Bashevkin, who has become a real known entity on the Jewish speaking circuit and is the author of a really interesting new book, as well as a humorist, humor columnist in various publications and on his own Twitter feed. Interestingly, I never met him before, but we have many, many overlapping friends and circles. And so this was a real wonderful treat to finally get to speak with him after knowing much about him and reading his work from afar. I think this conversation is particularly interesting in that it brings up some critical themes and topics that I think about very often as someone ensconced in the world of informal education, which is where Rabbi David Bashevkin spends most of his time, although he also teaches within the halls of Yeshiva University in a more formal setting. But he's clearly an exceptionally talented educator and presenter, and he argues passionately that rather than residing in a post-truth era nowadays, in which people don't really care much about content, about actual information, we are in a renaissance of ideas, but a world in which there is a great meritocracy of ideas. And so there's just a much more crowded playing field and we need to get people's attention with the quality of our ideas. And I think it's a really, really interesting argument and perspective to think about whether indeed it is the quality of the ideas on trial or the quality of the delivery on trial. I think he would probably say a little bit of both. The question is, how do you balance that? And in a world that seems to be dominated by edutainment and the need to stand out not only with one's information, but through the medium itself, whether that's creative videos or humorous quips, that balance of the value of the ideas themselves versus the value of their medium is interesting to consider. Also of extreme interest to me in this conversation is Veshevkin's almost scholarly analysis of humor and he being, from my perspective, very, very funny, humorous individual, I found this to be a really rich part of our discussion. I myself enjoy a joke now and again, and so it was really interesting to kind of dig deep and understand exactly what that is all about from a more academic or conceptual perspective. Once again, we are marching towards our 100th episode with some special surprises on the horizon, and it would be terrific if many others could hear those surprises and other episodes down the line. The way that could happen is if you share the podcast with them, of course, subscribe yourself wherever you may be listening, Apple, Google, SoundCloud, Spotify, but of course, share the podcast with your friends and family as well. Follow us on social media at Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on both Instagram and Facebook, with the letter U only on Twitter, or at our website at JewsYouShouldKnow.com. You can email me at JewsYouShouldKnow at gmail.com. Always welcome your questions, comments, feedback, and guest suggestions, which thankfully we do get via the inbox, and always love to hear from our amazing listeners. And now to our conversation with author, speaker, professor, humorist, director of education for the National Conference of Synagogue Youth, Rabbi David Bashevkin. We are here with the director of education for NCSY, as well as humor columnist, recent author of a fabulous book, Rabbi David Bashevkin. How are you? I am great. Are you going to tell them the name of the book? I will be telling the name of the book. (laughs) Synagogue. 
Synagogue, S I N, exactly. Although I did read in the in the review in the Jewish Action magazine recently, the one critique that uh, the reviewer had was yeah, he wanted a different title. The title, I got I got that from a few people, usually from you know a little like the purists who don't like uh, puns or winks inside of books. Uh, there was somebody who refused to to write a bio blurb because they hated uh, a blurb for the book because they hated the title so much. Really. I went ahead anyways. Did it anyway. Was, uh, what was the, uh, you were just so convicted about the title? I, I was very convicted about the title for two reasons. Again, the title is Synagogue, S-I-N, uh, sin, about sin and failure in Jewish thought. And I was convicted for two reasons. A, I thought of the title before I wrote the book. And I, I, I think it means something. The suffix agog means to grow, like a pedagogue means to grow and lead children. And the book was about growing and leadership even through failure. So I thought it was, it was, it was a pun that I couldn't walk away from, which is, uh, won't be the first or last of the time. <laughs> That's right. It's the hill you're willing to die on. So. Exactly. Um, so, David, let's take it from the top. Tell us a little bit about where you are from, what your upbringing was like. I was raised in the five towns that's in Long Island in Nassau County right uh, in the town of Lawrence. My parents moved there in 1980. I was born in 1985. Uh, my, my home is somewhat famous for people who grew up in Long Island because my house used to be on the same plot of the shul, uh, the synagogue where we were, and they picked up our house on the back of a truck and moved it across the street on Erev Pesach. So all the parents who wanted their children out of the house to clean for Pesach uh, had the entertaining uh, scene of seeing a house on the back of a truck. It was before I was born. My parents bought their house from somebody named Weinberg, who had two famous brothers. One was the Rosh Hashiva in Ner Yisroel. One was the Rosh Hashiva in Eish HaTorah. And the third brother was a real estate, a real estate guy. And they, they bought their house from him. Uh, I went to uh, fairly traditional schools. Uh, I went to DRS, a modern Orthodox high school, and then after I went learned in yeshiva Shalavim. And then after Shalavim, I wanted to learn in a full-time serious yeshiva. Um, instead of going to YU, the place where I had college, I went to actually near Yisroel in Baltimore. Um, an important fact of growing up, uh, which I've mentioned uh, many times, uh, and it's just, it's just so fundamental to who I am, uh, is that I grew up in a home where my mother was a writer and there were books uh, throughout the house and my father was an oncologist. So uh, questions, uh, you know, he took care of, of, of cancer, cancer patients, he still does. Um, but that type of meaning and intensity, uh, which, which lends itself to both seriousness and also a lot of jokes, to be honest, uh, was really at the center of our home. So. And I was going to ask you later about uh, about how you marry those two poles of your of your personality, um, which seem to be both very uh, pronounced. Um, I'm curious when they picked up the house, did they find any chametz under the house? Under no, the house? there was no, there was no no chametz underneath the house. No. Part of the Tom, the Talmud says, you know, that you don't have to search under immovable objects, you know, for uh, for leaven products for chametz. I guess this would be like the rare exception. If the house gets exactly, looked at. it's a wild picture to see a house on a truck and to have that as an Arab Pesach activity was really a godsend for the community. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, now, growing up, were you very passionate about Jewish education? Were you very you know, involved or were you kind of just more of a regular kid and just doing your thing? I've always described myself as somebody who played on both ends of the court, meaning I learned hard, played hard. I, I was a very young reader. I, I learned how to read at a very young age and I was reading full length legal thrillers in, you know, fifth grade. I was reading, I read all of John Grisham's books. John book. Grisham, yeah. <laughs> By the end of fifth grade, my diorama, you know, you had to make those dioramas in fifth grade, was on the book The Client, and I buried a Lego man underneath a Lego boat. Uh, <laughs> because there was a, uh, uh, the mafia hit a dead body under the boat, and that was my fifth grade diorama. I'm sure your teacher loved that. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were mortified. They were terrified. Thanks for being so morbid. <laughs> yeah, I was a little morbid for a fifth grader. But by the time I was in eighth grade, I already stopped reading fiction. I, I, I've read maybe a handful of fiction books since I've been in fifth grade, uh, which, which itself is an unusual choice, which books I've gravitated towards. But I started reading nonfiction, and I gravitated towards any type of learning. I, I grew up in a house of 
reading, learning, and I took to uh, to Jewish education and Jewish books at a fairly young age. But I was a, I was a wild kid. I, I liked music like the rest of them. I used to constantly go to uh, go to concerts, and I was a very nervous kid, um, struggling with anxiety, mental health issues for as long as I can remember. I wasn't able to fall asleep. I had sleep issues since I was in fifth grade. Um, that, maybe that it's because of that diorama you did. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, was, maybe that diorama. Maybe I shouldn't have been reading that much John Grisham. I mean, my mother came to the point where I realized I had a loophole where essentially I could read books that I wouldn't be able to watch the movies that were based on them. So when I was in seventh grade, I wanted to watch The Godfather. My mother said, no way, you're not watching The Godfather. I said, great, I'll read the book. And that's when my mother started to realize that all of these John Grisham books I've been reading were all rated R movies that she would never let me watch. But my mother started reading ahead and censoring the book, and she would basically cross out the words that were inappropriate. So when I finally got my copy of The Godfather that was censored, it looked like the Mueller report. It was like, <laughs> it, was re- it was heavily redacted. Heavily redacted. <laughs> heavily redacted. And uh, that's basically what I said, you know, I can't read this way. So I, that's when I really switched into nonfiction. What kind of a writer was your mother? Uh, she wrote short stories. She would write copy for, for marketing. But it, it was less of a home of a writer, of a, ho- a home of a lot of reading. There were books everywhere. Uh, you can see behind, uh, you're not going to see behind me, but you know, right now you can. My, there are books everywhere in my house now, much to my wife's chagrin. Uh, but it was a house being surrounded by reading, and I'm always creeped out when I go to somebody's house, whether it's for a meal or to pick somebody up. I'm like, you don't see books anywhere. And like, I think that's become more and more common. It looks like it's out of Fahrenheit 451, where you know, like they banned all books. Um, I, I'm a home, and probably the the number one luxury in my life is that I am ordering books nonstop. I never borrow books. I I buy books, and I just. I created a home like I grew up in that's surrounded by reading. What kind of reading do you like to do? Obviously, within nonfiction, are there subsectors that, that most draw you? Yeah, I, I, I have a rotation between, and, and they're all really the same, between economics, um, psychology, and, uh, and philosophy. But, but I really like economics the most. Behavioral that's economics I, meaning? No, regu- regular, I like regular economics. I read a lot, a lot of economics. And um, I read behavioral economics is where it intersects with psychology. Right. And, you know, th- th- it's like overlapping things. But my, my PhD uh, studies were in the new school. And the new school is like the most left-wing uh, economic school in the country. Um, I always say I, I, I look like the Mitt Romney of the new school when I would <laughs> walk around there. I did not look like a typical student there. But one of the things that was amazing uh, in the new school was really getting to the philosophy of economics and political theory. Uh, and I've been fascinated with it ever since. Was there an openness there to different perspectives? Were you able to push back at all? Um, yeah, but, but I, was, I was a new student. For me to push back at the director of the PhD program, whose classes I took, David Howell, who's a very left-wing economist, I would have gotten swallowed alive. I mean, you know, when you're talking to actual scholars, it's not like you can, you know, go in and quote, uh, you know, the five-minute clip from Ben Shapiro that resonated with you to argue. I mean, these, these were serious scholars who read books. Uh, I, I wasn't pushing back. I was learning. Um, I didn't agree with everything that I learned. But I was fascinated by everything that I learned. Did you feel, did, were you influenced by that perspective ultimately? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more of a centrist, which is becoming a rarer and rarer, rarer breed in economic thought, but I understood kind of the evolution of uh, of economic thinking and how it's affected how we define ourselves as human beings. You know, there's a great work by Carl Polanyi, I'm probably mispronouncing his last name, called The Great Transformation. It talks about how economics um, and finances have actually affected the way we look at ourselves as human beings and people, how we calculate our self-worth. Uh, that stuff still fascinates me. What about economics is so uh, riveting to you? And most people see that as kind of a, I think they call it the dark science it's kind of opaque and, and not the easiest body of knowledge to, to master. What about it has drawn you in? 
Um, I look at economics as almost like, it, it's like psychology, which everybody loves psychology. Psychology is, is how individuals, you know, navigate the world and construct self-worth. It, it, it's like psychology for community and societies, you know, less so, you know, similar to political science, which is about how they organize, but this is really how they interact. And, and the same way that you have abnormal psychology, which talks about how people fall apart. Uh, what's interested me through everything is about how people, individuals, communities, societies cope with failure. And economics is really interested about why people are prone, why communities, I'm sorry, are prone to, you know, fantastical thinking, irrational thinking, uh, what I would call, you know, the ab abnormal psychology of the economics world is all about market crashes and uh, and that's a form of crisis that society as a whole needs to figure out how did our relationship to value and to meaning get so askew and so warped that as a society we're left with this either a bubble or this great depression or great recession um, and it's asking very similar questions uh, that psychology asks on an individual level. Interesting it seems like uh... Economics is almost a window into beha the behavior of or the values of society, much like we know money is never just about money. It's, it's always a window into people's values kind yeah. of on the macro level. Exactly. Exactly. One of the great uh, privileges I had, one of the earliest guests on this podcast actually um, was Robert Allman. So, oh, wow. Yeah, that was, that was really a big cool. deal. I don't have a Nobel Prize. That's there you go. Not yet, I guess. One thing at a time, though. You know. First okay. synagogue, then Nobel Prize. You know? Yeah, that's, that's my next step. Okay, <laughs> that's, uh, that's extraordinarily impressive. Yeah. There you go. So once you got into the world of more serious Jewish learning, more serious Torah study, and uh, you mentioned in there Israel, which is where I, I myself also studied and got my, uh, my ordination, smicha, uh, quite a few years back, what was your next steps? Were you immediately drawn into the world of Jewish education? Did you, what were your kind of the options on the table? Was it, were you thinking about going into classroom education? You've sort of uh, settled in, in the more informal educational world. What was that? Uh, well, I, I do both really. I teach a formal class in Yeshiva University, in Sci Sims, um, in the business program, and in the morning program. I teach, you know, like a fairly, I mean, it's not a typical class because I run it in a very different way. My educational philosophy uh, derives from a very strange place, um, and it's not economics either. Um, I have, I was not drawn to Jewish education. I was drawn to the world of ideas. I love sharing ideas. That is what excites me the most. Um, and I felt that the career path that would give me the most opportunity, and I, I hope it's correct to share ideas, to curate ideas, to develop ideas uh, with people would be uh, education. Uh, I had also applied, I was going to do, I, I bounced around in terms of what my career path was. I had considered psychology, I was going to do a PhD in psychology, I was going to do a JD PhD um, in, in law and, and do something, a PhD in religious studies. There was a program in Emory I was very interested in, uh, but ultimately I decided I did a master's in Hasidic thought, uh, though I don't look it. Uh, I don't wear a strimal or have a bekesha. I did do a a master's in Hasidic thought, and then I decided, to do a, All right. I decided to do a PhD in public policy focusing on uh, crisis, on crisis management, which has really been, you know, the undercurrent of all my studies is how people, individuals, organizations, communities deal with uh, with crisis and failure. And that undergirds my classes, that undergirds my work in uh, NCSY, uh, that undergirds my work uh, in, in Yeshiva University and everything that I do is how people uh, deal with, uh, with crises in their lives. It's interesting you talk about being attracted to the world of ideas and, and education sort of being a, an outgrowth of that. Um, today, I think uh, we live in a world in which people aren't as, as focused on ideas. You know, people talk about a, a post-truth society and mm -hmm. a society in which people's attention spans are rapidly dwindling. How do you deal with that as someone who, who does love ideas and love sharing ideas? How do you interface with kind of today's reality outside of just staying in sort of an, elite, an elitist bubble where, where you know, maybe there's a top echelon of students 
but in terms of the broader public, the broader mass of students, how do you deal with that? Are you ever disheartened? And does this draw from your educational philosophy or does your educational philosophy that you kind of alluded to and maybe you'll expand on, does that come into play when you're, when you're thinking about how you can communicate the value of ideas and of real deep thinking in a world that seems so antithetical to that process? I dismiss the assumption that we are in a, um, in a post-truth society. I think that we are in a renaissance of, uh, of content, of ideas. And it's just that we're just crowded by a lot of ideas because there was a switch um, that's been taking place over decades between platforms and the content that's hosted on those platforms. Uh, maybe I'll start with my educational philosophy, and that will uh, weave into um, what I'm describing. My educational philosophy is based on the pedagogical uh, methodology of late-night television. Uh, I am a student of late-night television. I've read and I've always recommended the best books on management and leadership. And the best books on, on education and classroom management that I've ever found are Bill Carter's books about late-night television. He has two books. He has one about the fight between Jay Leno and David Letterman um, over their, their fight over The Tonight Show. And then he wrote a second book, uh, The War Over Late Night, about Jay Leno's uh, fight a couple years later with David Letterman. I, I always say I run my classroom like it is a late night show. And late night television has evolved a great deal since the time of Jack Parr and Steve Allen and, and ultimately Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson, yeah who's the one who made The Tonight Show what it was today. Everybody used to just want The, the Tonight Show, and there's a format that, that makes The Tonight Show uh, so amazing and, and why so many people fight over The Tonight Show, whether it was Jay Leno and David Letterman or Joan Rivers or, uh, or Conan O'Brien. Again, I can give a history of late night television a different time. I'm just name dropping now so I could flex so you could see how seriously I take it. <laughs> and I do take it seriously. I wanted, that doesn't, I'm impressed if you know the producers, you know, like the, the cameraman, come on. <laughs> so what, what, one thing that's amazing about late night television is that it's really evolved in that it's, it's, it's not about having the Tonight Show anymore. Nobody, nobody even knows of the shows who hosts the Tonight Show now. Most people wouldn't even know. The, the shows have become synonymous with the creators. We talk about, uh, you watch Jimmy Kimmel, you watch Jimmy Fallon. Uh, this is a insight that Jerry Seinfeld said in the epilogue uh, to Bill Carter's book, The War of a Late Night. Nobody cares who hosts The Tonight Show anymore. It's just synonymous with the person. Do you watch Colbert? Do you watch Bill Conan? It's synonymous with the person. So it's a the cult market, of personality, you're saying. Much exactly. I, well, I don't like the term cult of personality. I look at it as a idea meritocracy. It's not about having the platform anymore. Anybody can go online and share ideas. Platforms certainly help, but really more than anything, it's the quality of your ideas that rise to the top. And I have found that the public, more or less, has a discerning eye for content that they think is good in whatever area. And this is a renaissance where anybody can, as you know, uh, start a podcast, write a book, uh, share an idea on social media. Um, the only thing that's gonna distinguish you or the primary thing that's gonna distinguish you is gonna be the quality of your ideas. It's not gonna be about what platform you're associated with, not to say that that's not important. And that's why I think that if your ideas are good enough in 2019, it's, it's the most joyous time to share ideas because nothing is gonna distinguish you uh, from the next guy aside, again, the number one thing, not to say that platform is meaningless, but the number one thing is the quality of what you are saying. So describe your classroom, let's say at Yeshiva University or wherever you're teaching, when you say you run it like a late night class, like a late night show, what does that actually look like? How does that translate? So I teach a class, uh, whether it's Jewish public policy or Jewish engagements. Um, I teach a class on religious crisis, but almost all the classes, particularly the ones that I teach in Psy Sims, I run them like uh, it's a late night show. So I start off with a monologue. My monologue is about 10 minutes. I talk about what is going on in the world, what's been going on since last week, uh, particularly things that relate to the class. And then I... I run the class and it's driven by student presentations, which I call guests. 
Uh, I invite them like guests. They get applause line. They get applause line like guests. And I interview them. My class presentations usually, again, and I play different games. I think Jimmy Fallon's the one who's really um, opened this up, but James Corden does something similar, where it's not enough to have a guest at an interview. You have to play different games with them. And I make them prepare. So uh, usually in every class, we have one of three types of presentations. We either have like a, a point counterpoint where two students get up and debate something, uh, and then we take a class poll. Uh, to see who was a better uh, speaker, who was more convincing, who had more substance. Uh, the thing that's the most exciting is that instead of attendance, uh, I send out a survey at the end of every class uh, that basically is based on the following class's material. And I have the students weigh in on whatever issue is the next class, and the student who makes the survey, who I call our data scientist for a day, uh, then presents a sentiment survey based on what you thought about that next issue. So whether it's issues about uh, Zionism, uh, Jewish community, economics, public policy theories, uh, we make it really palpable and we show the class where, you know, to take a litmus test or take a, you know, kind of check their pulse on any given issue. Uh, that student then presents for 15 minutes and we have a discussion. But the class is broken up. There's never a period where I'm speaking for more than 20 minutes at a time, yep. uh, which like late night has kind of been broken up uh, to make it more accessible, especially because the real audience is online. I, I conduct my class in a similar way. Yeah, we found for sure in the, in the education we're doing on campus that we've just, we've scrapped um, frontal teaching for longer than, you know, 10, 15 minutes, almost completely and gone much more to like a discussion based model and much more to a smaller breakout group model because the, you know, this is the way people process information. But it's interesting that I guess you're holding their attention um, frontally in a sense by making it, by gamifying it, it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. Um, tell me about your writing, um, the genesis of this book, this is synagogue, S-I-N, and why is failure and crisis so important to you, so central to your whole focus, it sounds like in your teaching as well as your writing. Um, where did that you sort of almost, it sounds like an almost an obsession with, with failure or with, uh, you know, with the way people respond to failure. Where does that come from? I think uh, to a large degree, it came from things that I've struggled with in my own life. When somebody goes through a crisis of whatever variety, big or small, they are faced with a question which is that the value system that they used to construct meaning until that point, uh, it, it got them from point A to point B, is not going to get them from point B and onwards. And crisis forces companies, individuals, personalities to reevaluate the value system with which they viewed the, word, the world. The fancy term with that is a heuristic. It's the way in which you kind of process information and meaning in the world. And when you have a crisis, whether it's an organization that puts stock into a particular leader or product, or whether it's a person who put value into a certain uh, uh, system, maybe it's a religious idea, maybe it's a career idea, and that suddenly is pulled out from beneath their feet, they're forced to uh, kind of become more dynamic and flexible in the way that they approach their own lives. And it also creates a window to find a new value system and a new way to interpret information. So for me, this book is really about the different, it's, it's more of a collection of essays almost, yeah. about the different ways that Jewish texts and ideas have approached failure in people's lives. And what I found so fascinating is that there are certain areas and certain kind of value systems that are more prone to crises. I think religious life is one of the areas that's most prone to crises because it's so intangible. So in a way, it's so, so valuable, but it could also, it's so prone to be reexamined and to have major shifts uh, in a person's life. The less tangible it is, you know, to have a crisis in your home in like a physical object uh, is much harder. You know, take an earthquake or a tornado. Right. Uh, for your house again, but but to have a crisis in a value system and an idea is much easier. It could disappear in a moment. Uh, if you put your stock in being called a vice president, if you put your stock in viewing yourself as a you know a religious person, uh, that could disappear in a moment. It, it only takes a 
So what the book is about is specifically in a Jewish context, uh, how, how that happens and how people reconstruct their way from that. Yeah. So were there particular crises in your own life? That, I mean, you mentioned anxiety and mental health challenges early on. Were there any cataclysmic sort of challenges or, or challenges to your heuristic, to your uh, intangible, you know, whether it's religious frame or others that, that really shook you and, and forced you to pivot? I don't know that I would say that there was any seismic shift. I think that when you grow up and you're an anxious child and more prone to anxiety or depression. So, you know, it's like walking around outside without shoes and socks on. So every stone and pebble, uh, you really feel it a great deal more. And I think growing up as a child, you know, given the disposition that I had, I felt like I was walking around for years uh, and to a degree still to this day without shoes and socks on. So I felt every pebble and every stone, uh, which kind of cultivates a greater sensitivity to the human experience and the human condition in one sense, but in another sense makes you more prone to any major shift or any minor shift in your life um, that you that you didn't expect. And everybody has these sorts of things, whether it was, you know, career or marriage or or any of these things. But I think I was kind of more susceptible to how to, to cause kind of the a, a cataclysmic reaction, even though the event uh, may be by world standards fairly minor. So it's interesting, though, that it seems like your personal trajectory or your own Jewish trajectory it was pretty linear in a sense, like you, you've, you've been on a pretty stable track. So it doesn't seem like you made major jumps or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, my religious education is fairly stable. I think the part about me that is probably less stable is that I've always, to my own you know, credit and detriment, felt comfortable uh, connecting to Jewish organizations that could not be left alone in a room together. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to say which ones, but I think a part of that is, you know, let, let's say my new school affiliation. The new school is extraordinarily uh, left wing. It's proudly left wing. Uh, certainly the Jewish organizations that I affiliate are far more uh, right-wing. Um, without calling out specific Jewish organizations, um, I definitely affiliate and admire people uh, on very, uh, I would call, mutually exclusive ends of the spectrum of Jewish life. I interact with them. I have friendships with them. I have relationships with them. Uh, sometimes it gets me in trouble. You know, I have a lot of all the Jewish organizations I affiliate with keep a close eye on my social media accounts, I have people <laughs> writing in letters and getting me in trouble for things that I like on social media. You know, that's the price you pay from the institutional identities that I forge. You know, I have, you know, connections with larger Jewish institutions, and all of them want to make sure that I, I don't kind of step out of line, uh, but they all kind of know that I have affiliations and relationships with things that they don't necessarily agree with. And I imagine that's part of what they know they're signing up for and probably what they want on some level that you're bringing a little bit of, you know, spice to the table and you're not just towing the party line. Yeah, I do it carefully and I do it with the knowledge that there are some things I'm going to have to backtrack on. There are some things that I'm going to have to keep uh, more, more quiet and, and I have to live with a degree of contradiction and pain. It would be much easier if I was more, you know, sequential or didn't have uh, the Jewish affiliation as a part of my career and I could affiliate any way I want and not be threatened career-wise. But I understand that when it comes to institutional identity, by nature, you kind of need to have clear lanes and roadways. That's true with political affiliation. That's true with religious affiliation. That's true with communal affiliation to a degree. And so I'm sensitive to it. And I basically say, I, I came in knowing, I come in knowing that when it comes to any living with any contradiction, the difference of the pain is going to have to be borne by myself and not by the institution. Uh, they're not going to have it. They, 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 they don't want it. No institution wants it. And anybody who's worked for, again, it's not about a Jewish institution. Anybody who's worked for a company, uh, trust me, when the company finds out that you're doing things that they don't like, uh, you're going to be the one who's left with the short end of the straw. It's not going to be the company. So you have to do it. And and bear with the, the contradiction on your own and find the way forward, which is kind of what I've done.
have you ever been able to serve as kind of a bridge between disparate elements of? Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm the, the person you get in touch with when you want to know, uh, you know, a journalist, a writer, a thinker, a rabbi who, uh, you know, is very much not in your Rolodex, but you have an idea that you have somebody who might know them in a hush-hush way. You know, that's something that, I, that I'm able to do in, in both directions. And I'm proud online to highlight voices from, from both ends, even though, you know, sometimes I get in trouble for it. So we alluded to this earlier, but I think it's a really sort of central and, and fascinating part of your whole narrative. Um, and two things that I, I've noticed just without even knowing you and just kind of just reading, your write, you know, reading your writings and so forth. On the one hand, you're obviously- Thanks for reading very, my writings. What's that? Thanks for reading my writings. Anytime. <laughs> what a joy. I actually read it on Yom Kippur and Sukkot, so- there you that, go. That means a great deal. Thank yeah, the book. And I read it pretty often, and I'll, and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, you know, obviously, on the one hand, you are very dedicated, as you said, to ideas and almost obsessed with ideas and nonfiction and, you know, promoting that and studying them and sharing them. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, you're very noted as a, as a humorist, as a humor columnist. Uh, I love reading Mishpacha magazine, where your column is. I, I tell my wife, we, we, we actually laugh out loud like literally lol so it's, so it's and it doesn't oh, i appreciate we that. don't do that often like i really love it and it's really just kind of a, a an ongoing social commentary that you know is a very kind of inside baseball that you know most people wouldn't think is funny <laughs> unless you really live in the you know a narrow orthodox jewish community but i think it's hilarious uh, and you're on twitter a lot and known there there i am not as uh, attuned yet uh, it's but, mostly Nourish Kite on Twitter also. <laughs> so <clears throat> these are kind of two very different polls. Now, you know, I can maybe answer the question myself and say that humor ultimately means, you know, at its deepest level, really seeing the, the core of the ideas of a society or, or kind of poking fun at the contradictions and, and so forth. But how do you see it? How do you experience these two aspects of the personality? Writing about sin and failure and the heaviest topics, you know, within Judaism and theology and then these very lighthearted uh, sort, of, you know, sort of quips and, and, and jokes and so forth. Uh, a, I, I'm so appreciative that you notice that. Um, it's a question I wish more people noticed. And obviously you alluded to how I integrate it. Um, I think the answer to that question, if I would say, is anything closer to like the heart of who I am and the soul of what I'm trying to contribute uh, to the world is number one, I, I take humor extraordinarily seriously. Uh, humor to me is, is a philosophical discipline. It is a methodology. It is the way in which people construct meaning uh, through crisis. The great comedians uh, of the world, you know, going all the way back, uh, you know, Rav, Rav, uh, Rav Shamshin Rafael Hirsch, uh, who was a 19th century biblical commentary, famously points out that the, uh, the, the, joke in, the first joke in the Bible, the Jews are being pursued by the Egyptians and about to be killed. The Jews look back and they say, we're going to get killed here. You know, are there no, were there no graves in Egypt? Like, we, you had to take us all the way out here to the desert to bury us? And it's kind of a, a joke almost, like, like what, you couldn't, you couldn't kill us earlier? Uh, the earliest uh, gallows joke. humor. <laughs> exactly. It's a joke that emerges from, from crisis. And the great comedians who I look at as mentors, I, I, I almost look at them as religious figures. They, they have impacted my religious worldview, um, whether that's uh, Gary Shandling, whose documentary, Judd Apatow's documentary, uh, the Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling talk about his uh, his drift into Buddhism, and he died on Purim. So, oh, wow. uh, his yard site <laughs> is Purim. So, uh, you know that uh, that tells you a little bit about uh, what type of soul he had. Uh, or more modern comedians, um, you know, my my friend who you know I've interacted online, and and I really do consider him a friend, uh, Gary Gullman, uh, whose HBO special, The Great Depression Tour. Uh, came out right before Yom Kippur, and I told him, I think that this is Yom Kippur, uh, um, Yom Kippur mandatory uh, watching. I mean, don't watch it on Yom Kippur, but you can watch <laughs> it right before or right after, uh, because it's about how he used uh, comedy and how his comedy intersected with his mental health. To me, humor is the most um, 
the most surefire way uh, in the greatest throes of crisis, in the time when nothing else, all of your philosophy, all of your ideas, all of your uh, religious guidance seem to be of no use, the latter that you could always count upon uh, to create meaning in times of disaster very often is humor. It's something that Viktor Frankl men mentions in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. That he, he, I think the, the language he uses is that uh, the mark of humor is, is, is a indication of the art of living. Hmm. The art of living is being able to look at moments of difficulty and despair and turn them into a smile, turn them into a laugh. Uh, to our sociological oddities, our communal oddities, our religious oddities, uh, whatever it is, when some people throw up their arms and they get angry and they write letters, and I'm not saying that you have to laugh at everything, but to be able to take difficulty and frustration and pain and use that as an opportunity for joy and happiness and absurdity and silliness uh, is a skill that will make your life much more manageable. And it's at the heart of how I live my life as a person and how I would urge people to figure out a way to do their lives. When I am in my, you know, somebody just posted, I have a friend, uh, Joey Rosenfeld, uh, who I literally call a modern day mystic. He's brilliant. He's an addiction psychologist. I've heard him on, online. He's absolutely brilliant. I've heard him just speak about addictions. Yeah, before. he's, quoting he's, he's, he's brilliant and you can have him on here, but he recently asked, uh, where do you run to when you are in crisis? Uh, and people had very beautiful, very profound religious answers. They run to Shabbos, they run to Torah, they run to Jewish texts. And I said humor, I, and it was true. When I am feeling uh, down or difficult, uh, the places that I find most uplifting are the comedians who are able to take their struggles or the struggles of everyday life and turn it into something beautiful, turn it into something silly, uh, and turn it into something joyous. And I think that is the art of, uh, that is the art of living. What do you see beneath the surface of humor? I mean, when you're, when you're laughing, when you're going to that place, is that some sort of an affirmation that there's a, a deeper or a greater purpose to it all? What, what is the subtext of that laughter? Laughter, I mean, there are different philosophies of, uh, of how humor works. I subscribe to the philosophy that it's been attributed to a lot of philosophers. I think Schopenhauer is the one who spoke about humor as a theory of dissonance, where you basically have an expectation how a scene is going to unfold. And instead of unfolding sequentially as A, B, C, you see a wealthy man in a suit walk into a business meeting. Uh, he slips on a banana, banana peel, peel yeah. in, 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 on the way to the meeting, and it skips your, it subverts your expectations. It subverts the narrative of how you thought the scene was going to unfold. And why, well, why is that so satisfying? I, I think that is so satisfying because it expands the limits of what we find meaningful and how, what our narratives are able to explain. Normally, uh, a person approaches life and assumes that our life is only going to be meaningful if it unfolds sequentially. Mm. And what humor shows you is that sometimes, and it provides for you a narrative that encompasses a life that unfolds non-sequentially. Non and we find that so satisfying because true life as it's lived is never sequential. And what makes humor so palpable, uh, so enjoyable, and so satisfying, and so cathartic is that we see in our own lives when you thought that, you know, you were going to apply uh, after graduate school and get the great job and you get 50 rejection letters, uh, now you are stuck in this non-sequential moment and you are really have two fat paths ahead of you. You have one path which is a wallowing and difficulty and basically saying that the narrative that I thought would encompass my life is no longer applicable to this moment in my life. The narrative basically breaks. It breaks off and you are left with meaninglessness and that's called depression. And that's how people lead to depression because they're left in moments in their life that don't have the, the ozone layer, the, the bubble of meaning that's able to encompass this moment. 
what makes humor so satisfying is that it expands the narrative even into non-sequential moments and allows you to have some form of laughter, some form of narrative that's able to encompass the moment where your car breaks down before an important meeting, when you slip on the banana peel, uh, when your mom says something uh, really that, that grates on you and that you find undermining or makes you feel inadequate. Uh, all of these little moments in life where you feel that that sequential narrative ends, what humor does is it stretches it out a little bit and allows you to thrive even within that moment. And that is why humor is so satisfying. Do you relate it to kind of an underlying theological point from your perspective where really what you're saying is that because God is kind of orchestrating or, or God is opening your eyes to a broader picture or do you not connect those dots in your own thinking? Um, I do connect the dots. I do connect the dots. I don't do it overtly. I don't like pointing out, um, I don't like taking people's fingers and pointing it to God. I like talking about ideas and Jewish meaning and God in a way where they want to point and then bring God into their life on their terms. So I deliberately avoid kind of overtly, you know, like, oh, and that was God over there. It, to sure. me, it's like it overly simplifies what I think is the, the joy of humor and the joy of kind of expanding a narrative is having somebody have that quest where things cohere. I mean, coherence, I would, I, I think, is a reflection of godliness. I mean, we talk about God and always describe God as one and unity and all of that thing and all of those things. When people find coherence in their lives, I think what they are finding on a deeper level is God. But at the same time, I think when you you grab their finger and point it in the direction of God, it could sometimes have the reverse effect. Sure. I I wasn't suggesting it in terms of... No, no, no. I know. I know. I know. But I meant in terms of how you process it, how you experience it individually. You know, when you're having those moments of laughter, it's just like, this can't be happening, you know? And there must, you know, to to make make those connections. I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is ultimately the solace that humor provides a God solace? For me, it's a great question. It's a great question. I, my, my instinctive reaction is yes, but I, I, I am suspicious of my, <laughs> instinctive, of my instinctive reaction. I think I find God in the space right after the crisis, but before it's filled up. And I think it's in that moment that gives me the energy to fill that space up with humor. It's right before it's there that I feel the most uh, spiritual and feel that solace the most. Like in that brokenness, but where there's enough space to fill it up with something, so I'm not suffocating on it and, and feeling uh, overly depressed, is probably when I feel most spiritual. And it's that spirituality that gives me the strength to fill up that moment with humor. That's probably the process. Uh, which is probably of no interest to your audience. But if you want to know <laughs> my spiritual humor process, uh, that's how it works. Uh, I hope it works for you. His SHP. There you go. Um, so, switching gears and just starting to wrap up. Now, tell tell me a little bit about what you're doing with NCSY. I mean, that's kind of how I first came to know about you. Actually, if you want to know, uh, just to geek out on your writings even more, what my attention was first grabbed was when you wrote a byline about yourself that you uh, you pride yourself on always being flashing, always being uh, eating meat. That's a while back. That's a while back. That's, what I that's first, a while back. That's, that's when you first came to my attention. So I said, I like this guy because <laughs> I'm of the same uh, cut from I really school. appreciate that. Yes, I wrote a bio line that I pride myself on usually being flashing. Yep. Wow, I appreciate that. But my work for NCSY uh, in, in three primary capacities, uh, first and foremost, uh, I, de- I develop content for NCSY educators throughout the country, and we have an NCSY website specifically for educators. In other um, words, you're second- creating plug-and-play materials for them to go use. Exactly, exactly. And for their own, for their own growth. I mean, education uh, and religious education can be a very lonely, and in some ways it can be a very stunting field for people's religious growth, believe it or yep. not. And I try to make sure that that does not happen. That's number one. Number two is I do major national events that are run, including Yarche Kala, which is a teen learning event 
that will be taking place January 1st to 5th, which is an amazing program for kids who don't otherwise have access to a uh, you know formal Jewish educational experience during the year. Uh, we run that. And by the way, uh, just, actually, to interject, just to interject on that, just on a personal note, I actually uh, attended three Yarchei Kalas in, uh, in my own high school experience. Oh, wow. 92 to 94, something like that, and I, some, something along those lines. Three of the most magical weeks uh, in, of high school for me. I was in a Jewish community day school, but this was kind of, uh, they let me in anyway, even though it was designed more for public school kids. Eventually, I was on NCSY National Board, so I was very involved in NCSY. Uh, in the in mid- oh, wow. early mid nineties, but Yarchei Kala was a hugely influential event uh, or series of events in my own life. That is uh, that is amazing, yeah. and the uh, and the last thing is I I, uh, I work with uh, with regions and staff um, developing their their future their skills uh, as as educators um, in in a variety of ways, whether that's visiting regions or working one-on-one with educators. Um, it is a great joy of my life. I did not grow up, uh, in the NCSY world. I spent one summer on their, one of their summer programs. Uh, but the quality of the experiences and education, though informal, uh, is, is quite powerful. And I am a big believer, um, of the teenage years being a year, years, uh, that are uniquely suited for healthy, triple underlined religious growth. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. As the primary years, my father became most religious. I mean, he was always somewhat religious, became most religious uh, as a teenager. And it's a unique year for people to really examine and integrate a pathway for sustained, healthy uh, religious affiliation. And it's really a pleasure and a privilege to work uh, for that organization. Do you feel that a lot of the skills you're talking about when it comes to pedagogy and you know, creating these engaging experiences and the late night television model and so forth. Are they largely, are they largely teachable? Uh, assuming, you know, some baseline level of talent and, and so forth. I mean, it's, it's as teachable. Um, it's somewhat teachable. It's somewhat teachable. I've definitely seen people improve. I mean, uh, no comedian, you know, Jerry Seinfeld has had this conversation with Steve Harvey in his Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Yeah just to show you my breath of, uh, yes. of Torah knowledge. Uh, but they have a conversation about the efficacy of taking a comedy class to become a better comedian. <laughs> uh, no comedian is going to admit or wants to talk about uh, taking a comedy class. Most of the greats have not taken one, but all of the greats are constantly working on their material and all of the greats are constantly talking to other comedians to fine tune and help better jokes and all of that stuff. I would compare that to somebody improving as an educator, Jewish or otherwise. I don't think a formal class in Jewish education is necessarily the answer, but I think a mere obsession, a mere obsession with the quality of your ideas, the quality of your content, the quality of your delivery, talking to other people whose content and delivery you find amazing and studying them and becoming better and better at what you do of the same way that that is the methodology for the greats in comedy, uh, that's a type of culture that we try to bring uh, into NCSY, particularly among our NCSY educators. Tell, tell everyone how they can find you, where they can find you online, your Twitter feed, your book, your writings, what, what are all the different venues? Oh, wow. Do you have everything? Is everything curated in one place? You know, like what a, a joy. Chef, the Grand Central Dash Ideas.com. Uh, we thought about having, I think there, there is a website, but no, the, the best place to find me, um, probably one of two places uh, on Twitter. My handle is at D-Bash Ideas, D-B-A-S-H Ideas, I-D-E-A-S. Um, or my book is available on Amazon, uh, Synagogue, S-I-N. Um, and I have a page on Academia, which most of my more serious content uh, you could find on my academia page, just search for uh, David Bisheskin. You could find everything there. And my silly content, uh, you could all find on Twitter. Any upcoming uh, projects or, or new avenues with your PhD or anything that you're looking to? Finishing my to? PhD. That is the next frontier. Finishing my actual <laughs> PhD is the next frontier. No, but if it was up to me, you could have it right now. I just want you to know. I that. appreciate that. What? <laughs> What a, what a joy. Thank you. <laughs> Rabbi David Bashevkin, thank you so, so much for joining us. Really a pleasure speaking. Have a great day.
This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.